Thank you for tuning in to the Kubrick series Uncut. Picture this. You're a young, struggling actor, and you just land your first prominent role in a major motion picture. A dream come true, right? Now imagine your director is Stanley Kubrick, and you begin to get a sense of what an all-encompassing life-changer such an opportunity was for Vincent D'Onofrio. In fact, Mr. D'Onofrio has frequently stated that he owes his entire career to Mr. Kubrick. To be fair, Kubrick owes a large portion of the success of his film Full Metal Jacket to Mr. D'Onofrio's indelible performance as Private Pyle a young man transformed from a shy and awkward recruit to a monstrous killing machine. In this conversation, Mr. D'Onofrio talks about the development of his character and the unforgettable experience of working with Mr. Kubrick. I, I wanted to know, first of all, I mean, I know you've told the story many, many times, but, but you submitted an audition tape like so many others associated with the film, uh, didn't you? Right. Yes. Um Modine and I uh, were friends, and we had met at auditions and stuff like that. And uh, I was working as a doorman at the Hard Rock Cafe. I was doing theater at the time and working as a doorman for pay the rent. And um, he passed by with his wife, Carrie, one day, and I said, what are you up to? And he said, well, I'm going off to do this thing with Kubrick, he said you should send tape out there. Um, because there's this other part that hadn't been cast. And um, I sent the tape, and then I did a, basically I did a monologue from the play that I was doing. Mm-hmm. Put it on tape. And back then, the, uh, it wasn't easy to just put things on tape. You know, it's not like you could record them with your phone or anything. It was, you know, you had to rent a huge video recorder, camera, and a, a big tape deck that you carried over your shoulder and you know it was like a huge thing and then you had to find a you had to find like you know an NYU student that could edit it for you yeah. so that you could send a VHS you know it was like a big deal and uh but but I did it and then uh and then I got a call back and that started the uh the um the Stanley and I talking about the part and and uh, yeah, it ended up to be my first uh, film. Yeah. So I would imagine, as as a young person that that loved the art form of acting and and, and film, that you you had a great consciousness of of Mr. Kubrick's work at this time that you were offered the role. Oh well, definitely. I mean, you know, we go to a lot of revival houses and watch movies and I was you know, it was not only Kubrick's work I was at that time becoming really familiar with, but it was many other you know, um of the great American directors and European directors as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was a time of my life where I was educating myself on on film and uh had seen a couple of his films already but didn't really know who he was and then eventually learned about him as a filmmaker through watching these many different films and reading about them and stuff like that. When he when he started a dialogue with you about the role and about the film, uh how how descriptive was he about what he wanted out of that character? He he was well he, he didn't talk a lot about it, but he did say that, you know, he was weak minded and uh it was that and the pressure of the Marine Corps and the training process that made him, uh, you know, turn uh, into into, uh, having this psychotic rage, you know. So he did talk about it in simple terms like that, but nothing nothing, uh, too in-depth. But he wanted him to to appear to be a country bumpkin that eventually turns into a... uh, um, you know, a, 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 this kind of um, explosive killer. Well, I, I'm sure that you probably um, came up with some sort of history for this character. And and I'm curious, in your mind, what was it within him that made him so succe- susceptible to that kind of monstrous transformation? 
I think it was the you know the the strip down of of all of what of who he was you know as a a very kind of innocent pure guy and brought out the worst in his nature um, through kind of like humiliation and just kind of your personality being stripped down and, and being made into a killing machine. I mean, if he had been as intelligent as like Joker or Arliss Howard's character, Cowboy, you know, maybe he wouldn't have turned, you know, like many, many Marines uh, obviously don't turn and they become soldiers. And uh, mm-hmm. and some of them very good soldiers. So the the uh, the idea that he was weak minded, that, that he was able to be with, with not very much intellect, be stripped down to nothing, and that his core, the core that was left, was the fact that he could shoot really well. Mm-hmm. And the sergeant zoning in on that and praising him for his his uh, use of a gun. And then I think the, uh, the, the, you know, the psychological aspect, I think the pressure of it got to him and turned him. Well, I think that's the, and what comes through loud and clear in the film, obviously, yeah. is that that's the role of the, of the boot camp. Uh, it's to, it's yeah. to break you, break you down completely and then build you up again in their image. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I I have to say that you know, although I am a you know a liberal, I am not uh, anti-military. You know, right. it's, it's um, I have met, and it's so weird the way things work out in life because even though the film is about this is, well, even though we're talking about the film in this context right now at the moment, you have to remember that hundreds and hundreds of Marines have come up to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. in the many years since I've made that film and told me that I helped them get through that period Mm. of their life, that training period and or the Marine Corps itself. So you have to realize what a strange thing that is to hear. On one hand, you're like, wow, you know, that's that's pretty cool. And I always say, wow, I'm glad I could help, you know. Absolutely. And and you you think what the movie is about. Yeah, but I think that I think that they get what the movie is about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, because I've talked to a, f- a few veterans myself in in uh, assembl- assembling interviews for the show, and all of them say Full Metal Jacket is the one that got it right, because there is cer- certainly the the boot camp sequence at the beginning, but just overall there there's this intangible feeling that that movie gets just right about. The, the state of war. I mean, the state of being in that kind of conflict that that no one else quite got. Right, right. I think um, I've heard the same. I've heard the same. So yeah, it's yeah. just it's just interesting. You have to understand. It's an interesting thing that you consider what the film is about, and then many years later, there are actual men and women that have used that that film has helped them actually get to a period in their life. Which is it's just an interesting thing to me. Yeah, yeah. I want to know about uh, Kubrick's working process because, as I understand it, uh, obviously it's written about all the time about the numerous takes. But I want to know what that does to you as an actor. What that process is. Where do you start? Well, I don't. It, I don't think. I don't think. You know, I'm not sure that Matthew would say the same thing, and I know that I wouldn't say the same thing. I mean, I didn't get numerous amount of takes. I was present one or two days in a row where there was 70 or something more takes to a particular actor, but that was very rare. I I have to tell you, in my own experience, I have to tell you that that was not a common thing. That the, the, um, the big scene in the middle of the movie, um, where my character kills the sergeant and then kills himself was done in three takes. And that's mm. not including the special effect. And the special effect was done fairly quickly. It worked really well. A guy blew um, with his mouth, blew a soaked um, soaked tissue um, past my head to hit the wall. And we did that a few times. There was no explosive in the rifle or anything like that. It was just all acting. I held it to my mouth, and I pulled the trigger. There was no explosive at all. And I just threw my head back as this guy... Um, 
fire this um, blue, this um, wet, this red uh, soaked tissue behind my head. But the, the acting part of it was done in three takes. I only did my side in three takes. I don't remember how many takes Matthew did, but I remember it not being a lot at all. Maybe the same amount of me or maybe more. I don't know, but I know it wasn't a lot. Mm-hmm. I remember I remember that scene very particular. I also remember hearing a lot of stories, like you said, that you've heard about Stanley doing many takes, so I know he had that reputation. But, you know, I, would, I, I don't know if I was lucky or, 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 or what was going on there, but we never did that. I think the most takes I ever did was, for, was 11 takes, and that was because it was during the blanket party. There was, there's a shot where everybody's getting out of their beds in a sort of sequence while the, the dolly rolls on a track and so that was a very, he wanted it to have a, a, a certain rhythm to it as the camera comes up onto the bunk and you, you see uh, Joker and uh, Cowboy, if I'm correct, um, talking, uh, starting to talk to uh, to Leonard before he gets um, pummeled by the, by the uh, black right. 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 So that was a very particular shot. And I only had to do it. Uh, you know, I had to do it like 11 times. I remember being really exhausted because it was a very emotional scene for my character, but, you know, I was that's what I was being paid to do. Right. But could you feel the, as opposed to just establishing what you'd want to do on the first take and essentially repeating it each each subsequent take, did you mm. feel it evolving? Was that the kind of process it was in any given yeah. scene? Yeah, it evolved. I mean, you know, Stanley, you know, I think appreciated actors that each take would, as long as they didn't slow the rhythm down and, and the pace of things, he liked things to be at a certain pace. Um, um, but as long as, you know, he, he liked, I, 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 the one thing I do remember is that he did like actors that would start at zero each time and not repeat the exact same thing each time, but do a variation on what he liked. Mm-hmm. What, what the actor liked and what Stanley liked. You know, his main directions uh, to me were, you know, uh, keep the pace up, you know, do it faster and you can do better. Just do it again, do better. You know, and nothing specific about that last take other than if I wasn't in, in the correct light, he would make sure I understood. If there was a line reading that that he thought the words were better the way I said it or better the way he thought about it in his head, he would then say, you know what, reverse those two words, you know. And so mm-hmm. that was that, it was like that kind of a thing. Well, he, and you've said this, you've echoed this too, but others have as well, that that he felt when it came to the choices he made in any given film, it wasn't so much about achieving realism. It was about achieving something interesting and surprising. Right. It's, yeah. So you say real is one thing, interesting is better. Yeah. So, but you look at the performances in some of his films, mm-hmm. and and if you transplant those performances to any other film in a similar genre, they would seem uh, too broad a lot of right. times. Right. Right. Uh, did, did you ever feel like you were you were going too far in any given situation? No. no. No, but you have to remember if I was um Malcolm McDowell in Clockwork Orange, maybe uh-huh. I would have questioned him. If I you know, but because there were so many of those kinds that category I should say of performance in Kubrick's films by the time I was doing Full Metal Jacket. I didn't question him at all. Right. You know, there, there, you know what I mean by that? Uh, yeah, I do, absolutely. Yeah. And and it must have been fascinating for you when you were finally able to see the film because obviously there's a great portion of it that you weren't at all involved in. Uh, how, what, what were you particularly taken by when you saw it that first time? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's weird for me because a lot of people enjoy the first half of the movie so much. Yeah. And and the second half not as much. And I feel exactly the, the opposite of it, if that because 
I love watching the second part of the movie. But number one, it's Matthew's in it, and I love Matthew's acting, and Arliss is in it, Arliss Howard, and I love his acting, and all the guys that played the other um, uh, platoon members, but also the way, you know, the, the city of way stuff is shot and and how it's so different than any other war film, um, the way it's shot, except for maybe, you know, the other one that's there and did like Paths of Glory and... and um, so, so you know, I just see it's it's, it's a strange thing for me because I can never feel what a lot of other people feel about that movie. I I've always watched enjoyed watching the, the second half of the movie far more than the first half. <laughs> I wanted to ask you too about uh, Stanley, the, the the man himself, because a predominant kind of assumption about him is that he was. Uh, cold and clinical and intellectual and, and very I- ironic with his work and, and there is that element but I think a lot of people miss the absolute compassion in his work because it's not sentimental um, yeah I mean did- I, I, I do think he was a bit in a very kind of in a very um, not in a deep kind of uh, narcissistic way not at all in a narcissistic way although I don't know if I didn't live with him, so I didn't know if he was in a narcissistic nature or not. But when I say, but I, but I want to use the term he was a little bit antisocial, but mm-hmm. not in a narcissistic way, in a very kind of um, uh, no nonsense way. And and um, I appreciate that because uh, I he I never felt as if I had to perform for him or be intelligent for him or uh, be as uh, clever as him because you were allowed to just have very quiet, long, um, nonverbal moments with him and feel perfectly comfortable doing that because he was very much like that. He would sit. Um, I remember sitting with him for long periods of time where nothing was nothing was said on the set. And he would also... we. We were often invited, Matthew and I, to his house on weekends to watch movies with him, um, and because uh, he had this great old school, old school now, but then it was state of the art, like um, screening room in his house where it was two full-on movie projectors that he changed the reels himself on, and he would have films from Warner Brothers would send him films that he could he could watch in his, in his screen. Or so in that way, he was very social, you know, just in a very yeah. kind of not on some sweat. But on set, he wasn't cold at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's something, you know, very interesting to me, for me has happened in the last um, few weeks because while I was shooting in Los Angeles, I'm back in New York now, I'm done with the film, there was the... Um, Kubrick exhibit at the LACMA at the LA County Museum. Right. And I hadn't watched Full Metal Jacket in I don't know, 15 years or something? A long time. And uh, and hadn't thought about uh, Stanley in, in quite a while. And you go to this museum, I was invited to this museum, and the minute you walk into the museum, the first thing you see is his chair encased in glass. And it's the chair that he used on our set. And um, that was quite moving for me. It caught it took me off guard. I had no idea that I would react the way that I did. And uh, it was a very odd thing to see his chair in case in glass. And, but, but one of the other interesting things that happened is that there's actually footage of Stanley and Matthew and I talking in Stanley's trailer um, before... Um, uh, I think one of the, I think the big scene in the bathroom, mm-hmm. and uh, it's you know it's fascinating. I mean, and we could just just from that footage alone, you would be able to see that Stanley Kubrick was not cold, that he was very engaged with his actors and loved them to come up with great stuff, and and was very concentrated on the work, the dialogue, uh, more so than talking about any kind of, well, he never talked about any kind of emotional place you were in or anything like that, but it was spoken word, the word that the characters, the words that the characters were saying, and he loved to watch you improvise, and then he would type it all down, and then, of course, if he liked what he heard and what he had typed down, then you would have to stick to that dialogue. Right. But that 
but I, I guess what I'm saying is my point is, is that in that footage of, of the three of us talking, you can see that he wasn't at all like that. Yeah. I, and I and I see it in his films. And to be honest with you, it took me a long time to get there. Uh, the the yeah. Kubrick films for me, I mean, they're, they're different experiences. I watched I watched them at twenty, and I I probably didn't quite get them or feel them as deeply as I do now. As as someone uh, nearing forty, uh, they evolve with time. I know. Uh, I agree. I just got just two more quick questions for you, and then I'll let you go. Yeah. You've been so generous with me. Thank you. Um, I, I was just curious if you've if you had an opportunity after Full Metal Jacket to interact v- very much with him. Um, not a lot, you know. Um, it's not my personality type, and and definitely not his. And and um, no, not a lot. I mean, there were occasions when we before the movie came out that we talked. He would. Um, you know, ask me questions sometimes while he was finishing his cut, and 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 um and how you know what you know he one time we had a conversation of how I thought the movie was being perceived when it was released, and mm-hmm. you know I was so young and and so enthusiastic. I mean, basically, you know, there was a sense even then that I had that I was you know, that this man has just started my career off. And there was a, I, I remember having the feeling that I, I think I'm going to be working for a very long time now because of this man, because yeah. of the film. You know, so any, so I was, so you know, any conversations that I talk about um, that I had with Stanley are all coming from a very young my, man who had no experience at all in filmmaking and 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 only the beginning of of it, my acting, but you know, and and then you know, and, and then no, and then the then it stopped. The communication stopped, and I I was always you know wondering you know when he was going to make another movie, and he came out with Eyes Wide Shut, and then and then we lost. Him. Yeah, and when you, I mean, obviously we have great unique voices out there in, in filmmaking, but. What do you think we're missing as a film culture without Stanley Kubrick out there making movies? Um, one less amazing director. <laughs> That's what we're missing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I I think that will there be somebody else to take his place? Yeah, I think so. Will there be, you know, can you compare one director's work with another? I think it's a very difficult thing to do. And you look at Stanley's whole volume of work. He was a, you know, he was a a great, great filmmaker. And then, you know, you compare him to like Godard or Chupo, and their films are so different. Um, and they yeah. were great, great filmmakers. And so there's going to be a lot of great, great filmmakers, and have been since then. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that. Now there's one left. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Vincent, my friend, thank you so much for giving me time. I really appreciate this. Yeah, you're welcome, man. All righty. Have a great night and a holiday. Right. Great holiday. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.